morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Brody. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our Grand Round speaker, um, Dr. Lombardi. Uh, just a few things about him. Um, he's Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine. Full professor. professor. Sorry. I made it in July. Ah, congratulations. Thank you. So, so, um, so Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology. Also serves as the Director of the Complex Coronary Artery Disease Therapies um, in the UW Medicine Regional Heart Center. Um, he earned his medical degree uh, at Tulane University and then completed all of his training, um, his residency and fellowships in cardiology, heart failure, cardiac transplant, and interventional cardiology at the University of Utah. He joined UW Medicine in 2014, um, and today um, he comes to speak, us, speak to us as a true pioneer in the interventional cardiology realm, particularly as it relates to the development of successful procedural approaches to cor coronary chronic total occlusions and complex coronary artery disease. So please welcome me in uh, having Dr. Labardi present the changing paradigm of coronary artery disease from angiography to physiology. Sounds good, thank you. So thank you, Megan Buckets in Soldatna, best root beer floats you'll ever get. <laughs> My kids love it. We used to go and fish the Kenai every year. So um, I'd like to thank you for having me. This is the first time I've ever done a Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, it's a bit surreal because I grew up 45 minutes here in Kent and went to Kentwood High School. And I am now a professor of medicine and get the honor of giving Grand Rounds here at an institution that I couldn't get accepted to for medical school, residency, or fellowship, <laughs> despite it was my first choice every time. <laughs> so sometimes things work out. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I try to have so many that they equal out. Uh, my wife working for Phillips is probably the hardest one to manage. The other thing that I like to do as a proceduralist is often you'll see people give up and give talks about things, but they rarely actually have to prove that they're talking about stuff they do. And having gotten in a loop by the circle, I can tell you I go to meetings and I see people talking about stuff that they don't actually do. So I think it's important as an expert to actually prove to you that I'm an expert. So in 2016, I did 367 PCIs, 280 of which were chronic total occlusions, what I'm an expert. That's the most of anyone in the United States. Last year, I did 379. Our program did 358 CTOs. And again, that's the most of anybody in the United States. The issue is when I talk about complex PCI and I talk about CTOs, I'm not talking about it. This is what I do every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So I'm sure all of you have seen our real medical literature. It's called the New York Times um, or Twitter. So uh, last I checked, stents were bad. No, no, stents are really bad because they actually don't work. Then we have to, uh, heart stents don't actually help. And then this is my favorite. We get stents that may do more harm than good. So this is what we know about stents. Stents are bad. Now the question is, are stents are bad? How we do trials bad? or are the operators bad? And that's what we're gonna talk about as we go through this, is really reevaluating what's going on and why the press gets to keep publicizing this without much of a response. So I want one other disclosure. My profession has spent 40 years debating that it, its competitor was bypass surgery, and I would tell you I think that's silly. Bypass surgery won. Cabbage is better. I'll be the first to tell you I'm really, really good at PCI, and surgery's better, okay? We need to get over it. Instead of sitting there saying, well, we can do this and they can do that, get over it. What we need to understand is why does bypass have better outcomes than PCI? Because it has nothing to do with the graphs and it has nothing to do with stents. Okay? Once we understand that data, then we can actually get better. And last is, are medicines better than PCI? Do we hold everybody to the same accountability? Are there treatment differences? Are there study problems? So this is for everybody in medicine. This is how you become the world's best cardiologist. This is how you reduce mortality of patients with coronary disease. If you put all your patients on an aspirin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, they fix their diet, they exercise every day, and they take their statin, you have now reduced the mortality as well as any cardiologist on earth. So don't overthink it, okay? Just put them on the drugs. Surprisingly, less than 60% of people with coronary disease end up on this therapy which is kind of sad. And is that 
what is behind that? We can, that's a whole different discussion, but it's a very recurring theme that about 40% of patients with an indication for something don't get it. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about is when we talk about PCI bad and medicines are good, let's talk about the data. So the data with medicines is there's no benefit on heart outcomes. Maybe they make you feel better. And also I want you to remember is all of the, the symptomatic improvements either on SAC or they were done on submaximal bruise protocol stress tests. So it was, we could make you exercise longer on a submax bruise. And that comes up because there's a trial that came out that did it differently. Okay, so the reality is, again, remember A, B, C, D, E's. And when we start talking about treating symptoms, there's no hard data for the medicines either. Okay, so this is my wife. This is our transition slide. My wife ran the 2013 Boston Marathon. I have a lovely video of the trash can that blew up. Um, fortunately for me, my wife is a 320 marathoner, and so we were done and back at the hotel at the Weston Copley when the bombs went off. Um, but she is the reason I get to do what I do, and she actually is probably the best thing in my life. So let's talk about trials. Well, when you talk about procedural trials, for everybody in here, when you have to look at trials, I want you to think hard. I don't want you to read the quote in the New York Times because they love to make things up. What I want you to do is think about why is the data look the way it looks. So in procedure trials, which often try to get run as drug trials, it's really hard to do that. And the reason is there's a bunch of biases, and I'm not a statistician, I'm just a dumb knuckle dragon interventional cardiologist. So I can't even tell you what these biases are. But what I would tell you for the, the, on an issue is, what it means is we tend to not randomize people we think will have benefit, because we already think there is benefit. So we actually don't randomize the people who should show the difference. The second is, we can't do what the patient needs to get done. So it's really hard to randomize. People always ask me about CTOs. Well, why is there no randomized data? Well, it's hard to randomize a procedure that nobody can do, okay? And the third is, there's this unconscious bias. We tend to influence the outcomes of trials for a variety of different reasons. And then the last is crossover versus intention to treat. We tend to want to make these hard outcome trials intention to treat, which for a therapeutic procedure is stupid because it only matters if they actually get the procedure, and I'll talk a little bit about this. The most famous thing that you probably never heard of is a drug called bucindolol. So I, I was a heart failure transplant doc. My, my research was in beta receptor physiology. If you really want to go to sleep, we can talk about that. But, and I worked with the guys who developed beta blockers in heart failure, Mike Bristow, Jack O'Connell, Dave Taylor, Dale Renlund, Mike Gilbert. So best was going on. So there's this great drug, it looked a lot like Carvedol, small startup company, they're running this big randomized trial. And halfway through the trial, the Data Safety Monitoring Board gets together, and it's almost where they have to stop it because the, the trends are so great, right? It's class effect, beta blockers all work. But they don't. Two weeks later, my mentor publishes in the New England Journal of Art Medicine, the US Carvedol trials. And amazingly enough, over the next 12 months, the curves, came back together. So was the drug bad? What happened? Why did the drug get bad? Listen, what happened is the people, the trialists, the researchers thought it was unethical to keep people on the drug, so they crossed them over onto active treatment. But it's an intention to treat trial. So guess what? The Sindelol and the company went bankrupt, they went under, and they never got approved. So was the drug bad, or were the researchers bad? So we have to think about this, and it comes up a lot in therapeutic trials. And when we talk about evidence-based medicine, right? It's, right, we talk about statistics and population. I get this all the time, you know, the mortality of your procedure is nine per thousand. That's basically with CTOs, your risk of dying with what I do is about nine per thousand. So, and they all look at me and they go, well, that's not gonna happen to me, except I know it's gonna happen because it's a one or none event. So you've gotta think about, the benefit, because we take a shotgun approach to most everything we do in trials. So how many people here heard about Orbita? Everybody see the New York Times last year? PCI bad, stents bad, no effect. Well, I wanna talk about Orbita and tell you about how Orbita's bad, okay? And, I'll, and I wanna just keep it as much as I can clean to trials, all right? So here's the thing, so they, they found people who had symptoms of 
of angina. They put them on a medical optimization phase. So everybody got this intensive medical optimization. They then did stress tests and a bunch of things and then randomized them. And then they actually did physiology to see whether the lesions were real or not. And they showed that 27% of the patients that they enrolled in the trial actually didn't have a physiologically significant lesion. And they stented them anyway. Now, if I did that, I'd go to jail. Okay? So we're fixing a quarter of the people in the population weren't even people that should be in the population, but they did it anyway. The second thing as an inducement, which is interesting, every patient enrolled in this study had an incentive to do it, which is they knew they'd all get stented at the end, which jumped them in the queue. This was in England. So the queue was quicker to be rolled into the trial. And actually, interesting enough, they never talk about it. 90% of the patients at the end of the trial got stented. They didn't stay on medical therapy despite what the results of the trial came out as. All right, so that's that. Second, ignore the left side. Look at the right side of the screen. So our optimal medical therapy, you had a telephone consultation with a cardiologist one to three times per week. You had home blood pressure monitoring. You also had direct access to a cardiologist. Larry, is that what we do in our practice every day? No. no. <laughs> Anybody in here going to talk to their patient three times a week? No. So this is great. It's really nice from an academic perspective, but the reality is, how are we going to make that work in Soldatna? That's not going to happen. My other interesting thing about this, how many people in here have been present or had a bruise protocol stress test? Anybody? All right. So everybody knows that every three minutes, it gets harder, right? It's designed nobody wins. I only know one patient who completed a bruise, and that was John Stockton. Um, he was an NBA player, and at 24 minutes, he'd not made his target heart rate, and he's like, can I be done now? And we're like, yeah, you're good, man. I don't think you're going to die. <laughs> so, but what's interesting is that the Orbital was designed to show a 30-second difference in exercise time between PCI and medicine. That was its goal, okay? Now, what's funny is, after your medical optimization, and we randomized you to PCI and surgery, PCI already won, because... PCI arm could go 38 seconds before we even started the trial, which is kind of funny. The other funny thing is, if anybody knows, at 540 seconds or nine minutes, something happens in the bruise protocol. So all the PCI arm to make 30 seconds more had to go through the switch from stage three to stage four. And anybody who's been involved in a treadmill, stage four is where everybody craps out and dies because it gets steeper and faster. So you set up a trial that's going to be really hard for PCI to win because it's got to go through something totally different than the people in medical therapy. So when we talk about how great this trial is and stents are bad, first of all, 27% of the people didn't have the disease. Two, it was a little bit gamed on the treadmill and the endpoints. And three, there was an inducement by the people in the research to get the patients in because they all knew they'd get stented. And the others are a little less symptomatic. How about courage? Everybody hear about courage? Courage. Medicine's great, stents bad. Well, what's interesting is, did anybody know that 92% of the people screened for courage didn't go into it? So how does that apply to the population health if 92% of the people aren't eligible? Okay. Second, Again, we'll go back to Bucinolol. It was an intention to treat trial. Crossover rate was 4%, 4.5%. So if, you're, if your crossover rate, all your power calculations, somebody tell me this, all these power calculations are based on a crossover rate of 4.5%. So if your crossover rate's more than 4.5%, then your trial's meaningless because you can't, your power calculations are all wrong, your input's all wrong. So the crossover rate in Courage was 34%. And again, it was published as intention to treat, not therapy received. Intention to treat, it failed. Therapy received, PCI actually won. Nobody wanted to point that out. So good trial, bad trial, I don't know, seems a little bit funny. All I can take from courage is that 34% of people on medical therapy who are minimally symptomatic and don't represent most population still end up needing a stent because the medicines don't do the job. And all this led to a bunch of very famous people, Steve Nissen at the Cleveland Clinic, who I'd love to have an offhand discussion about, but I won't, but Dr. Nissen is um, an interesting person. And David Brown, who's at WashU now, who's on his fourth job because he seems to not be able to hold a job. Both of them are very big Twitter people, and they tweeted out that our ex-president should not have been stented. And this shows what America is bad, because Bush didn't want to take medicines because he likes to ride mountain bikes. 
And he didn't like the beta blockers because it affected him writing. And even with, with drugs, he couldn't ride his mountain bike as hard as he wanted. So he got his LAD stented. And what he said is it wasn't their LAD. So it's easy for people to pontificate. I mean, I can tell you, I did heart failure transplant. I don't know if I'd have a cardiac transplant. And you'll never know until you're actually faced with the decision yourself. So the last little trial thing I want to talk about, just to finish the intention to treat or therapy received, is stitches. Everybody knows stitches? Stitches was a randomized trial of bypass surgery versus medical therapy. There's no PCI here for end-stage heart failure, people with bad LV systolic dysfunction. Now, what's interesting is, at five years, the trial was neutral. At 10 years, there was a therapeutic benefit in surgery one, okay? But if you look at the first five years, it's a bit interesting. And what you see is, if you're randomized to cabbage and you don't get it, you actually have the worst outcome. If you're randomized to medicine, you do the next worst. If you're randomized to cabbage and get it, next. So if you look at just medicine versus cabbage, cabbage is winning. And then if you look at the people who are on medical therapy who get cabbage, they actually do the best. So because of the, the difference of med, cabbage, cabbage, med, that washes the trial out and makes it neutral. But if you looked at it as those who got cabbage versus those who got medicine, the trial wins at five years. So we present it as a negative trial but to me, it seems like if I have LV systolic dysfunction and I can get cabbage, I think I want a cabbage, okay? So, interesting. So you really need to think about procedure trials that are presented as intention to treat. Because what we want to prove is, does the therapy work? And so if you don't get the therapy, how does that help prove anything? That's a blackbird. When you're in Soldatna, don't get too close to those. <laughs> the black ones are the ones that are mean. The, the brown bears are okay, the black ones are mean. And then moose are the worst. You know there's more people killed by moose in Alaska than bear? Unknown fact. Of course, when you hit them with your car, it's really bad. All right, so I like to make fun, and I especially like to make fun of the Cleveland Clinic, if you didn't know. Um, and the reason being is this. The Cleveland Clinic is the number one cardiac hospital in the country. Why is that? Well, one, they do 4,000 surgeries a year. Okay, they do almost more surgery than any other place in the country. Number two, they have people whose sole job is dedicated to ensure that their data for the US news is perfect. Because I can tell you, we don't even keep track of it. Okay, so you can game your data to ensure that you get a higher ranking. Three, a lot of it's built on reputation with specialists. Everybody on earth thinks the Cleveland Clinic is the greatest place on earth for cardiac disease. I would tell you is, they are great for cardiac surgery. I would not go there for an interventional procedure. Okay, so you have to understand what makes up the quality. So one of the problems I have is we have public reporting, right? Public reporting. We have to look at operators. And I will, as a disclosure, I am the second worst interventional cardiologist in the state of Washington by public reporting. My partner, Ravi Hira, who's at Harborview most of the time, he is the worst interventional cardiologist <laughs> in the state. Thank God for Ravi. <laughs> so the reality is, is, am I a bad interventional cardiologist or do I just do procedures nobody else does? The reality is I do procedures nobody else does. But unfortunately, because the way public reporting is done, it actually is harming populations. So this is one slide, my partner Jamie McCabe actually is the author of another that showed the same thing, which shows is if you go have a heart attack in a state with public reporting, you are more likely to die from it than if you go have your heart attack in a state without public reporting. So when you have your heart attack, go to Alaska, don't have it here, okay? And this has unfortunately been repetitively shown because what happens is, People don't want to look bad. I'm weird. I don't mind that I'm the worst interventionist in the state. But most people don't want to do that. Most hospitals don't want you to do that. So they'll game the system. But what you end up doing is the people with the most benefit, those at highest risk, get ignored because people are afraid of the outcome. And unfortunately, that's not what we should be doing in healthcare. Uh, so why does this occur? Well, I would tell you is because the operator variability in interventional cardiology, and I'm not gonna pick on any other specialty because I don't know it that well, 
but the operator variability is awful. So I am a CTO expert, and I can tell you the procedural success rate, if I get two shots at the University of Washington, we have a 97% success rate. I still fail, I still got issues, we still have bad things happen, but we're pretty good, okay? And I spend all my time going around teaching and traveling where people come here, and there are centers that can get 90% pretty much without an angiographic exclusion. But if you look across the country, only 3.8% of the PCIs are, and the, the general rule is it should be about 15% of people should be getting treated. 17% never even get an attempt at, their, at an institution. And the overall success rate of people who even try is only 59%. So why is there so much variability? Why is it that we have people who don't know what's going on? Well, I would tell you that this has to do with a couple things. One, we had this made up thing about access to care. So in the late 90s and then early 2000s, there was all this, we need access to care for STEMI. We need access to care for STEMI. So we need more STEMI programs. We need more PCI programs. And so actually from 1997 to 2008, there was a more than 50% growth in the number of PCI programs in the United States so that we can improve access to care. And we increased the population covered by 2%. So were we really trying to increase access to care or we were just trying to make more jobs and make more money for hospitals, right? Kansas City has 13 cabbage programs. Chicago has 82 interventional programs. This wasn't about access to care. This was about money and jobs. And nobody wants to do anything about it. In most programs, we, we don't need to go that. The other problem that you get is we talk about minimum competencies, but we don't actually enforce them and we don't actually care and we don't publicly report it. So this was an evaluation of median operator volume. So when we started doing PCI, the guidelines came out and said the minimum competency for an interventional cardiologist was you had to do 75 procedures a year or you shouldn't be doing it because they actually looked at an operator volume curve and the inflection point's actually about 100. So they were trying to be nice, so they dropped it to 75. So the NCVR, which is supposed to protect patients, follows this. And so what it showed is there is the median operator volume for PCI in the United States. Um, 33, I don't know, seems less than 75. So based on this data, when the guidelines came back out, they said, we'll lower it to 50. So the guidelines right now are the minimum competency for the United States is 50. By the way, board certification, has no influence on procedural outcomes. And second of all, the boards request a case log of 25 procedures. That's it, to take your interventional boards. And I had a friend, as a joke, didn't actually send in a log, and he's a board certified interventionist. They didn't even check it, nobody cared. All they wanted was their check. All the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic wants is you to go to their board preparatory course. Okay? Does that affect outcomes? Well. I can do a bunch of hand waving because this is what all the famous people like to do is play with the statistics and make it look okay. But at least in the crude uh, rates, complication rates higher, mortality higher if you do less. Now realize that's quartile. That means 25% of the people who do intervention in the United States did less than 15 per year. Well, you know, we, we have the guidelines. We have smart bodies, the ACC, Sky, AHA. They'll, they'll affect that. We'll, we'll make that better, right? You know, people are going to retire out, and we'll, we'll get the volume thing fixed. So what happened when we relooked at this next four years? Well, actually now 44% of the procedures done in the United States are by people who do less than 50. So half your chance when you go to get your STEMI is a one in two that the person doing it has done less than 50 PCIs in the last year. Okay, and high volume operators would be 29%. And again, does that affect outcomes? Well, maybe, kind of looks like it. And again, low volume operators, they're more likely to work at low volume hospitals. Now the original C port to work without surgical backup, you're supposed to have high volume operators at low volume hospitals, but we've got the reverse. They're more frequently doing STEMI, which is potentially more high risk. They use less radial, so they're not as up to date. And they use way more contrast and way more radiation because they're not as up to date, okay? So maybe not optimal. Now, when I presented this to the presidents of ACC, AHA, and Sky, 
I got this. Well, there's no real data that, you know, procedural volumes are connected to outcomes. Now, it is for lap coles, it is for bypass surgery, it is for PCI, it is for TAVR, but we're going to wave our hands and say that's not true because it affects our membership. So I'm going to have all of you involved in the next big interventional trial that I want to do. Now, remember, I got to do informed consent. So let's see how many people think their parents would enroll in this trial. I want to do a trial that says you need a PCI. I'm not going to tell you what the anatomy looks like. I'm not going to tell you. You need to have an intervention. And I'm going to randomize you as the patient to someone. Is Group A is they do less than 50 PCIs a year. Group B is they do 150 PCIs per year. And you're going to blindly get assigned to it, so you're not going to know who's doing your procedure. You good with that? You want to enroll that trial? No? Why are you laughing? I mean, we want good data, don't we? And if you're laughing, what you're saying is it's the trial of a parachute. We don't need to do that trial. We know what the answer is. Okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit now as we move into what I'm supposed to be good at, which is CTO and complete re-ask. I want to talk a little bit about those who do find a way and those who don't find excuses. So when you're getting involved in healthcare and you're doing things, are you finding a way or are you finding excuses? And there's this technical innovation cycle, which is on the bottom, which is, are you an innovator, an early adopter, the early majority, late majority, a laggard? And the question is, is as you've gotten older and progressed in your career, have you gone from the innovator to the laggard? Because it gets harder and harder to change over time. So for all of you who are young, you want to stay on the front end of this bell-shaped curve, not the back end, okay? And the other, for people like me, is interesting is, the people who were the innovators are now the ones preventing innovation because they'll often repress people from moving forward. So I want to talk about, again, symptoms, okay? Because what I want to talk about is one of the fallacies of my profession, which is my profession in general treats pictures, not patients. And I want to talk about patients. I'm a heart fair guy. I learned by a bunch of wackos who said beta blockers were good in heart failure while they got ostracized for years. Okay, so let's talk about angina, stable coronary disease. So when I took my board review, because I had to, you have to take your boards and stay current, so I had to take my general cardiology boards, it was awesome, and I had to read this board review book from the ACC that I spent lots of money on, and what it said is the first symptom of angina is not chest pressure, chest tightness, and my arm hurting. What they said is it's fatigue. The second is people get short of breath. The third is they get chest pressure and chest tightness. Now, in interventional cardiology and general medicine and general cardiology, there is a lot of um, accommodation. And this is physician accommodation. What you do is you tell the patient, you're okay, you don't need to be fixed. So what they do is then they just don't do anything anymore. I have a, a well-known patient who for 14 years, his clinic notes said that he was asymptomatic. Interestingly enough, he got a stress test every year that showed 42% of his heart was ischemic because he had an LADCTL and an RCTL, but he was asymptomatic. So when you talk about it, he knew that if he walked faster than three miles an hour on a treadmill, he'd get angina. So he just became asymptomatic because the docs ignored him and he knew what not to do. So was he really asymptomatic? So think about that when you're talking to patient. Are you talking them into the symptoms? You talking them out of the symptoms? What's really going on? And the reason I bring this up is myocytes are stupid, okay? Heart muscle cells don't know anything. All they know is I got enough oxygen to do my job or I don't have enough oxygen to do my job, right? Now, there's lots of reasons why myocardial oxygen demand outstrips delivery. You can have critical AS with high wall tension. You can be septic shock and hypoxic as all get out. You can be anemic as all get out. You can have a physiologic FFR positive lesion. You can have a 90% lesion. You can have a chronic occlusion that's a millimeter, a chronic occlusion that's 100 millimeters. You can have a vein graft with a, with a problem in it. Every one of those, when we look at the pictures, is different, and we treat it different. But the physiology on the myocyte end is exactly the same in every case. So I will tell you, this is a little bit more for cardiologists, but why do we send people to cabbage? I'll tell you why, because we don't like the anatomy. If it's easy, we do PCI. If it's hard, we send it to surgery. If it's really hard, we send it to medical therapy. 
doesn't seem quite, so we're doing something wrong here, okay? So that's the smallest fish my son caught one summer. It was awesome. <laughs> so I want to talk about, so has anybody in here heard about this thing called the appropriate use criteria? No, okay. So in interventional cardiology, when I was in practice, this big giant thing came out by a guy named John Spurtis, trained here, Phelps Saddle Angela Questionnaire. He and Paul Chan went to the NCDR and they got permission to look at PCI doing what they were supposed to be using RAND methodology. And RAND methodology is this, there's a methodology where you take a basically a bell-shaped curve and you look at how to shrink the bell-shaped curve. Unfortunately, they did it unethically or inappropriately, or what's the, the appropriate political word? I'm gonna get it wrong. But what they did is they only looked at overutilization, and they made a false assumption that there was no underutilization. So there was this huge thing that came out as, interventionists are doing interventions on people who shouldn't get it, and you know what? They were absolutely right, because we were treating a bunch of BS disease that didn't need to be treated, which is why stents never worked. Good for them. But unfortunately, they didn't look at the other side of the curve. So a guy up in Canada did look at the other side of the curve. So this is 2,600 patients who got an angiogram. Okay, so they had symptoms suspicious for cardiac disease, abnormal stress test findings, and they got an angiogram. And they looked at the appropriate use. So this is early in, in the AUC issue. So if you look on the left, those are people who were inappropriate. So I would make the argument, why are we cathing people with a rarely appropriate indication for revask? Seems kind of silly, but apparently we do that a lot. In the middle, you have uncertain, and then you have appropriate. Now, I'm going to focus on appropriate, but I could focus on certain too. But what I want you to see is, of the people who have an appropriate indication for REVASC by the AUC, now remember, the AUC is the most conservative academic body on approving that you should get REVASC. So if they say it needs to get done, it should get done, okay? And what we see is 33% of people who go to a cath lab with an appropriate indication for REVASC don't get it. Okay, is that because they don't need it or because we can't do it? <clears throat> and interestingly enough, if you look at it, when we do PCI and people who are inappropriate, Dr. Spurtis and Dr. Chan were absolutely right. We harm people and we shouldn't do it. And I agree with them 100%. But I'd like to see everybody in the media and in this room get as up in arms about the exact opposite end. Because if you don't revascularize somebody with an appropriate indication for revask, you do just as much harm. And what we tell people is a lie. Oh, you're okay. Take the medicines, you'll be all right. And why do we do that? Because interventional cardiology is not up to the task. Okay? The red line is incomplete revask with PCI. Okay? And this goes back to low volume operators and other things. But we basically, half the time, don't get the job done. Awesome. My profession needs a kick in the butt. So why don't we? So this is something called a syntax score. You don't need to know it. All you need to know is the bigger the number, so as we go from left to right, the bigger the number, the more disease. Now, the more disease, the more opportunity to lower that number and make people better. Okay? So bigger number, more disease, more opportunity to make better. So in this trial, how did the interventionists do on changing that number? Well, that doesn't look right. So if you had really simple disease, we did a good job. When the disease got more complicated, we actually got worse. And my smart friend from the Mayo Clinic says this is an interventional risk treatment paradox. To me, what it means is when the going gets tough, we run away. Now, I would go back to those who make excuses. So what are the excuses? Well, too much calcium. Well, that's a lie. We know how to treat that with atherectomy. Chronic total occlusions. I've been doing this for 10 years, I've worked with thousands of people, but we still are a long way from people taking the effort to learn to get good at it or avoiding the zone of repugnance and referring it to those who can. Bifurcations, osteo, long lesions, every one of those lesions is treatable. And I can show you how and I can tell you how and I've talked for the last 10 years trying to teach people how. The problem is of the 7,000 interventionists in the United States, only about 1,000 go to any kind of training over a five year period. Between 6,000 people doing the job are spending more time getting their echo board reader certification than they are learning about how to do PCI. It's kind of sad. Does it matter? Yeah. If I leave you with a residual syntax score, if I leave you with a burden of disease over eight, then your mortality goes up. 
If I can make it below eight, then I'm actually doing you help. But again, what we do is just say, here's your medicines, it's okay. Here's your medicines, it's okay. It's okay that I can't do the job. It's okay that I don't refer you. We make a lot of excuses. And in the end, this is why cabbage is better. Because an average surgeon, when you go to cabbage, does a much better job of revask than the average interventionalist. That was a good day for me. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about what is one of the biggest barriers to complete revask, which is what's called a chronic total occlusion. That means that the blood vessel is 100% plugged up. Now the way interventional cardiologists fix things is just like you guys do a central line. We take a, we take a instead of a needle, we use a guide catheter. Instead of a J wire, we have a little coronary wire about the size of your hair. And on x-ray, we drive that down the flow of blood and then anything we pass over that can go in, which is a balloon and a stent. It's not really all that hard. It's kind of like a big video game. The challenge when it's totally blocked up is there's no path to stick the wire. So solving that can be a challenge, and that's what I've spent 10 years is basically stealing from everybody around the world and trying to put it into a more systematic format of how to make it easier and safer. And the issue is this is one of the places where you'll see the biggest care variability of patients is patients with angina and a chronic occlusion. So this is again done out of Canada. What it showed is 18% of people presenting to a cath lab who have never had bypass surgery have an obstruction. So one in five people who get cath are gonna have a CTO. If you put bypass surgery patients in, that's 50%. So in most cath lab, the number comes out as one in three people getting cath have a CTO. What's also interesting is the attempt rate was only 10%, seems funny. What's even more funny is 87% of them had angina. So most of these people were uncertain or appropriate for revast, but only 10% got stented. And what was also interesting, if you looked at it, is everybody knew who to send to cabbage. Because all three centers in this study had the exact, it was like 23, 24, and 25%, but that was really close. That's good, no care variability. So we know who to send to cabbage. PCI, scattergram. 1% in one lab, 10% in the other. But I'll go back to is, remember 87% of those people had symptoms. So more than half of those people with symptoms and disease and ischemia didn't get treated. They got handed their tablets and said, you'll be fine. So I get often approached, well, there's no data to fixing CTOs. Well, there's not. It's hard to do a trial of something you can't do, okay? The second piece is, if we don't believe that CTOs affect outcome, and we don't believe CTOs matter, then this slide shouldn't exist. So this actually uh, was done at the Seattle VA by uh, Christopherson and repeated by Aaron Grantham. And what they looked at is patients matched for EF, sex, multivalent disease, diabetes, smoking, perf disease, renal function. So populations are identical. The only thing different was their angiogram. Now if CTOs don't matter, then the angiogram doesn't matter, and they should look exactly the same on who gets what therapy. But it's not. The biggest reason you go to bypass surgery in the United States is the presence of a CTO. The biggest reason you get medical therapy is the presence of a CTO. Has nothing to do with your stress test, has nothing to do with diabetes, has nothing to do with other than we can't treat it. I actually just had a patient sent up from Texas who did not want to have bypass surgery because he was told because he had a CERC CTO and an RCA CTO and a 70% LAD lesion, he needed cabbage. Patient refused. They decided to come up here. We fixed both the CERC and the right, and we did physiology of the LAD, and guess what? The LAD wasn't significant. He didn't need it bypassed. Happens all the time. We'll talk a little about that later. When you fix CTOs, I know this is a shocker, we don't have randomized trial data, but I can give you at least a meta-analysis, it makes people feel better. I don't have randomized trial data, it's always success versus fails, it's all I've got, because we can't do a randomized trial, but it makes sense. Biggest one I'm gonna get is the British Cardiac Intervention Survey. 14,000 patients who had an attempt for CTO PCI, and the ones who failed, and again, these were all on optimal medical therapy, they had a worse mortality at four years. Matter of fact, the mortality rate for that is almost that of a high-risk nuclear stress test, okay? 
And if it's something to do with the procedure they attempted, seems a bit funny because the mortality curves continue to separate out throughout the entire treatment time. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the minimum competency. So that's my father. If you can't, you know, the magnetic re re resemblance, that would be my dad. My dad was a uh, DC-10 captain for United Airlines. He retired with 34,000 hours in the cockpit. He spent four years as a flight instructor for United, and he was a very, very hard taskmaster. Having flown airplanes and driven boats, I can tell you he was a perfectionist. Um, and I'll also tell you is every six months that I was alive, my dad had to go to Denver and spend three days in a simulator crashing airplanes. And they flew every potential bad thing that can happen, because the minimum competency for a pilot is a standard 7x deviation from ours, right? How many times you walked in the cockpit and said, hey, can I see your credentials? You don't. You don't need to because of that, right? Southwest Airlines blew an engine out, rolled the plane over 45 degrees. A passenger, unfortunately, went out the window. That is the first fatality on a U.S. carrier in nine years. And if you listen to the cockpit recordings of the pilot, never gets excited, never gets upset, they roll the plane out, they take it back to the airport, they land without incident. The reason is, she's flown that every year for a decade. Sully, who landed the plane with no engines in the Hudson, flies that, it's a, it's a standard thing they do every time they're in the simulators, is dead stick a plane into something. So he'd done it. Do we do that in interventional cardiology? No. I can tell you right now, the, the, to maintain an accredited echo lab, you have to do 30 hours of echo CME to keep your lab accredited. And I was a general cardiologist doing intervention in Bellingham. So every two years, I had to do 30 hours of echo CME so that we could keep our board accreditation. Do you know how many CME hours I had to do for interventional cardiology? None. Which is more dangerous? All right? The other is when I sit there and say, hey, you can do intervention, right? We talked about low volume operators doing STEMI and I'm doing CTOs. But what we say is here, you can fly that Cessna 172, you can get in the cockpit and fly the DC-10, you can fly an F-14, uh, excuse me, on an aircraft carrier, right? We can do PCI, you can do anything. That's what the patients think. Do you think those pilots are all the same? Do you think the minimum competency for each of those guys is different? Or women, depending on the reality is, it's totally different. But we don't hold ourselves accountable to that. Does it matter? Yeah, a lot. It matters to patients. And you, can, you know, I upset a lot of my, my profession because I'm basically calling us out. And the reason I'm calling us out is because it matters to people. It matters to your mom and dad. It matters to your brothers and sisters. We need to be able to treat patients and do a good job. Because this is not PCI. This is PCI or surgery. If you get complete revask, guess what? You do better. If you make a bunch of excuses and put them on their tablets, people don't. This is out of the New York database. This is Hannon who does a bunch of this work. What it shows, if you have a STEMI and you get left with incomplete revask, you can sort of look over to the right-hand side of the screen. Not a shocker. The more disease you leave behind, the worse the disease is, the more likely you are to die. Doesn't seem like rocket science to me. Same thing for non-STEMI. So just so you know, I'd like to see consistent data. Everybody loves the meta-analysis, and amazingly enough, if you do a meta-analysis of complete versus incomplete, whether it's PCI or surgery, all the hard endpoints look good. So why are the hard endpoints of PCI bad? Not because stents are bad. It's because the operators are bad. And we need to do something about that. And I've talked about this for five years to a bunch of leaders, so I'm blue in the face, and I will not affect change, and we can talk about the barriers to it, but it's frustrating. And what happens if we actually do a good job? So. A few years ago, there was a trial of surgery versus PCI. They were supposed to randomize to PCI versus surgery, but 30% of the people went into a registry. What did everybody in the registry get? Surgery, because we couldn't randomize people because they were too hard. But in the ones we actually said we could do an equivalent job, surgery crushed PCI, unless the disease burden was really, really simple. Okay, so some friends of mine in the UK looked at this, looked at some of the things we've been doing, and they redid syntax called Syntax 2. And what they did is they did state-of-the-art PCI. They did physiology. Let's not stent or bypass stuff that doesn't need to be, have it done. Let's use IVIS guidance so that we optimize our stent results. Let's fix CTOs and have a high success rate at doing that. And if we do that, how do our outcomes look? 
Well, one, they found that 30% of people who had multivessel disease by angiography who were being sent for bypass surgery, a third of them had a vessel that didn't need to be fixed. Now, if we think the power of bypass is the limit of the LAD, you figure out how many of those LADs didn't need a graft. Okay? We did a way better job on CTO. They had an 87% success rate in fixing CTOs. Great, so that means now we're actually, just like the surgeons can graft a CTO, we can actually get them fixed. And what did they find when they looked at primary endpoint? When you look at Syntex PCI, which is Syntex 1, which is the red, in Syntex 2, awesome. State-of-the-art PCI works and it helps patients do better. All right, so now after 40 years of the battle of PCI versus surgery, how do we do against surgery? We tied. <laughs> 40 years and we tied. In the grand scheme of things, it's not about bypass surgery versus stenting. It's about doing what the patient needs. And at the end of the day, what you want to do is reduce ischemia. If they don't have ischemia, orbita, you can't get, make it any better. If they have ischemia, then you need to figure out how to fix it. And the more ischemia, the worse it is. So I'm an interventional cardiologist, so I have to show some GWOW pictures and pat myself on the back and tell you how great I am. So I'm gonna do a case here. So here's an interesting case. This is a 54-year-old guy. He had a, a bare metal stent of his OM at age 44. The stent occluded, and he was sent to cabbage at age 45. And he got a lemur to the LAD, he got a vein graft to the OM, and a vein graft to the PDA. Uh, several years later, he came back, he had recurrent angina, big ischemia with normal LV function, and two of the bypass grafts were occluded, his lemur was open, his doctor said, well, there's nothing we can do with stents, so he sent him to the Cleveland Clinic to get a redo cabbage, which he got two veins. A year later, he's having angina, they recath him, and both of the grafts are now toast. All right? So he's now got class three angina on three drugs with a high-risk nuke. That would be appropriate for revesc. He's told by his board-certified interventional cardiologist that there are no treatment options. And I will tell all of you young people in the room, I get in trouble for saying this, but I'm gonna do it anyway, which is that is actively stupid, okay? Because if a patient can get on Google and figure something out and you can't, that's a problem. There's a reason there's up to date. There's a reason there's all this stuff. I had to go back and do a library and pull papers, you know, the actual thing that they make from trees. We actually had to pull papers and put them on the chart of every patient, okay? But board certified interventionist, who's supposed to be great, said zero option, you have no hope. Good luck, maybe we'll talk about a transplant, okay? So when I say, do we need to see the pictures? Hopefully everybody in the room says, no, we know the guy can get treated, right? Somebody, I'm gonna throw something at you, wake up. <laughs> there we go. So this is what he's got. Um, I don't have a laser pointer, Vanna White it. Anyway, this is, a, this is a coronary angiogram. The little things on the left are sternal wires. Um, it's not gonna show. Anyway, you have to trust me, an occluded circ, an occluded PDA with an open lemur to the LED. So, third time, should we go for another cabbage? Realize there are almost a thousand third time cabbages in the United States, okay? Not sure I would do that. Hope and poke. So if you're around interventional cardiologists, what you'll often hear is say, I'm gonna give this a try. I love that line. I'm gonna give this a try, it's the Yoda thing. Have you ever heard a CT surgeon opening the chest going, I'm just gonna try and do a cabbage, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we can do Renexa, stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine, my chief of medicine has been working on this for 20 years, someday we'll be able to make the heart regrow itself, but we're not there yet. EECP, anybody know about the geezer squeezer? It's always fun, you go and you get the blood pressure cuffs against your legs. You're 54, you got two kids, you're not able to work because of your angina. Should we tell you just live with it? Or should we fix them? So fortunately for this guy, because this goes against populations, he didn't listen to his doctor. So he went to another doctor, who then said, well maybe I can get the circ open, and they tried. And that doctor just happened to have been to a course here recently, and after they failed, she sent the guy up here. And this is what we did for him. And this is what the UW does a lot. So this is just what we call anti-grade wires. I'm just sticking a stiff wire through the occlusion and into the first OM. That's not all that sexy. 
that stent. So that, what's been bypassed twice, is now open, but there's still another one to the underside of the heart called the PDA. So I do a procedure where we're actually gonna go what's called retrograde. So I'm gonna go from his LAD into the PDA. So this is me taking a wire through a little tiny septal invisible little thing, which when I first started doing this in 06, everybody thought I was crazy. I uh, probably still am. Anyway, then by going backwards, we can shear through the occlusion, with what's called a knuckle. And then we actually use that to mark where to go antegrade. We do a bunch of magic. We put some stents in, and that guy goes home with complete revask and a risk of restenosis of about 6.7% at one year. He's back working. He's a year out. He's not ever current angina, and he and his kids are pretty happy. Okay? So, and that's just another view of it. So what I want you to, to think about is, one, when we look at trials, is the device bad or the people doing the trials have issues? When we look at procedural-based trials, do we need to look at intention to treat or do we need to look at therapy received? Lastly is the pictures are meaningless. It's why did you cath them? If you believe they have symptoms and they have abnormal stress tests and you cath them, all you're saying is you don't have the disease, great. But if you do have the disease, you're obligated to fix. Otherwise, don't cath them. There's a risk to doing that. I would tell you is I don't believe that there's an impossible case. There's always somebody better than you. There's always something new you can learn. But there is always an option to get people treated. Am I perfect? No, I still fail 3 to 5% of the time. But I'm getting better every year. And the only way I'm going to keep better is being that innovator. I'm going to keep working and pushing the envelope. But my whole profession needs to have that envelope pushed to quantum level four. That's why I would ask you is to work with the societies and change minimum competencies for procedural-based fellowships. It should be impossible that I need more echo CME than I need interventional cardiology CME. Okay, We need to technically get better. So with that, I would just tell you is minimum competency matters. I appreciate your time. I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for having me. It's been wonderful to do it.